Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world, welcome back to The Caring Economy with me, Toby Usnick. Today, we have the privilege of speaking with Ramita Anand. She's a trailblazer in the field of empowering young women and girls through mentorship. As the driving force and founder of Elevate, a renowned organization that focuses on nurturing the potential of young females, Ramita has made significant strides in creating a supportive and transformative environment for others. Through her leadership, countless young women have been inspired to pursue their dreams and overcome challenges. In this interview, we will delve into Ramita's personal journey, the impact of Elevate's mentorship programs, and her vision for empowering the next generation of female leaders. Welcome to The Caring Economy, Ramita Anand. Oh, thank you, Toby. What a lovely introduction. That was very kind of you. Lovely to be here. Great. Ramita, um, we always ask our guests to open up by giving some maybe two or three minute digest of their life story, how they got where they got, maybe where they were born, how they were raised, mentored, pivots they took. So give us a sort of digest of Ramita Anand's life, please. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it is a very uh, interesting way to start interviews. I think it's great to look back on those pivotal moments that probably shape you as a person. And if I think to where I am today with Elevate, I think there were three major uh, probably um, events or circumstances that have really led me to come together and, and be uh, where I am in my sort of personal journey and my professional journey, I think. And one of them was um, remembering what it was like for me to be a teenager uh, and a young girl myself. And in my, just at the start of my teen years, I lost my mum uh, to a battle of cancer and my teen years were actually quite challenging. And I think I probably didn't know I was tapping into things like resilience and, um, you know, self-belief and trying to overcome a lot of the, the, the challenges that teenage years present without my guardian and my favorite, you know, my person, my, that person that I would go to for everything. Angel. Yeah. yeah, that was really tough for me. And then I became a mother myself. And obviously, uh, I'm raising a, a teenager who, who's wonderful in her own way, but completely different uh, in, the, in the that she's not a first generation immigrant family growing up in a world where, you know, lots of things are not the same way for her. And she's obviously growing up in a digital world. So that was really interesting for me to draw on what it was like me for me to be a teenager and watching my own teenager. And I know every generation moves along, but really sort of focusing on why um, the, the this, this particular generation of Gen Zs are are of such concern in terms of their well-being and, and where the concerns we've got for them. And then the the second, obviously, and being a teenager of young tweens and teens and, and being in education and, and listening to teenagers and, and, and teens talk about what their life looks like. You know, sometimes you get the privilege of hearing things when you're a, a teacher that other parents or their parents might not hear. Um, and then entering the world of neurodiversity, really, because my son uh, was diagnosed with autism when he was five. And that really opened up a whole new world uh, for me and understanding young people with difference, not just learning differences, but any kind of difference. Right. And I think being a teenager for, for, for those kids is, is even, as I know from my own son, is, is even more challenging than others. So I wanted to find a way to create a platform that could mentor young people to feel included and their best self, really. Awesome. So you referenced the immigrant story. What What is your sort of background in that regard? Yeah, my dad um, emigrated from India to Canada, which is where I grew up um, in the 70s. And so I, he was working very, very hard. Uh, my mom worked very, very hard uh, to build a life for us that would be um, the, better than the one they led in, in India. So uh, at that time, the chances uh, were that didn't always get um the same opportunities that you would in North America. So my my dad ended up in Canada, and actually we we learned through his example of of grit and grafting and hard work and sacrifice. Really, I think I'm always fascinated by diasporas. I think they are sometimes more powerful and stronger than anyone can realize. And I wonder yeah. if you feel a very strong Indian identity still in Canada, even though you were not. You know, you, you know your father yeah. was not there, but you were. I know it's really interesting. I think um, when parents uh, leave their home country or people leave their home country, 
I think there's a desperate need to try and hold on to whatever they can. And they try to recreate as much of that community in that world, because that is all they know, especially when they're, although Vancouver, where I grew up is very multicultural and they very, you know, they did celebrate all cultures there, but that sense of identity and family and story and, and culture and community was very important to my parents. So I did feel a strong connection, um, but weirdly, it didn't come to me till I was much older. When I was younger, I very much rejected it and wanted to be like most kids. Um, I wanted to blend in. I didn't want to stand out. And I used to almost resent my my uh, faith and my religion and my culture. And, you know, I wanted to be as all my other Canadian counterparts were. So I wanted to do ballet and I didn't want to do Indian classical dancing. That yeah. kind of thing was, was really big. Age, yes. Yeah. 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 So I was there, but as I've gotten older, I think, um, yeah, it, it's so important to me and my, you know, it, but it, but it hasn't really translated into being able to pass it on as much as I would like That's to, because the way my parents taught me the language and I went to India once I got older and spent lots and lots of time with my grandparents and I, love cooking the food and speaking the language and listening to the poetry and the music. It's all beautiful. Yeah. So, so tell us about Elevate then. How did, how did that come to be? Well, first of all, why don't you describe for our audience what Elevate is, build that bridge from your sort of your story of growing up and your passions and how you made this company. Yeah, it really, it was a real result of, um, looking back on what I've learned from my students. So I taught for for 15 years in, in private sectors, public sectors, single sex schools, and all, you know, both. And, and my personal experience was that something happens between primary or junior school uh, and, and senior school. And I'm not quite sure what it is if we focus on the wrong things. And, and the more stories I was hearing about children who didn't have confidence issues, who didn't struggle as much in primary school. And then because I work and teach kind of within the same areas in my lucky enough to be in the schools. And so we li- we're like a little bit of a village or a community. And I would run into a lot of these parents, you know, on my dog walks or having a coffee or at the local shops. And and you'd ask after their kids and, and you know, more often than not, they would say that their daughters are struggling at senior school. And, and that was always a sort of a, a little bit of a painful point for me to hear, you know, because these are kids I was really fond of and I loved working with. And then hearing that they were struggling and finding senior school hard, which is a natural progression for most teenagers. I completely get that. But there seemed to be um, an increased level of anxiety for parents and worry about what was going on to, with their young girls and, and the way they were self-sabotaging, self-harming, hurting themselves. It was just so many things. It wasn't just academic, it was social, it was emotional. There were so many uh, factors. And that really made me do a bit of reflective work on what is it that happens between junior school and senior school. And I think where I've landed, and, and I, you know, I, I, time will tell, is that we spend probably too much time preparing them for the academics, so, you know, getting them ready for the next set of exams and and, and maybe even talk, you know, doing some work on sports and all of that is all wonderful. But I don't think we teach them about the actual skills that they need to navigate when they get there, which is building new friendships with confidence and believing in themselves, having empathy, being able to name feelings, being able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And so I really thought long and hard about what could we do. And I think my view of all of this was that we needed a preventative educational system. We have a wonderful way of doing that with healthcare. We do that with medicine all the time. Preventative health is so important, you know, do everything you can to for your well-being, your physical well-being. And, and now mental fitness is becoming a massive thing, particularly um post-pandemic. But I started thinking about this just before the pandemic hit. And and uh, we were on that rise of social media and we were on the rise of smartphones and things were sort of really spiraling um, in that world for teenagers. So I, I wanted to see what it was we could do. And, and that's where the idea for Elevate came about, which was how can I use my educational experience, my, my experience as a mother, my understanding of neurodiversity and difference and how can I make young fe- people feel prepared and empowered to be the hero of their own journey rather than relying on other people or other things or other factors to do that for them? So can you tell us about sort of the um, the architecture or the structure of yeah. Elevate? What, what exactly is it? Yeah. Does one find it if they think your services might be a yeah. Yeah, so it is best to start online because I have so much built up there. I was just, as I said, it all came to fruition before the pandemic, but launched 
just as the pandemic was in full flow. So I ended up using a lot of the online new world of, of doing things like you and I are today on, on lovely Zoom. Um, so I do do and I work with lots of uh, schools and I work with pupils and children um, online. But basically the, the foundation of, of it is how can I set up and, I, and these are normally called soft skills but I think I like to use Simon Sinek's phrase of human skills uh, around empathy kindness resilience EQ and um, confidence building so growth mindset and, and using the science so my major was um, in science and neuroplasticity is a big part of my belief system so I use a lot of that um, because I don't think you can tell pre-teens or teens uh, you know just breathe and life will get better I, I do think they need to believe really seem a bit more than that and I think the evidence behind between you know your brain plasticity and how you can grow your brain and do brain health um is a wonderful way so I do use um a lot of my teaching ex experience I use a lot of the lessons I did so we have an eight-week program that was developed and curated after lots of you know lots and lots of reiterations of how I might deliver these concepts um, to children and I've set up a program or a, or a curriculum the Elevate School Scheme of Work that works with schools if you if schools are interested in implementing it into their well-being lessons um, but I also run a specific program for young girls that or uh, families that might want to work one-on-one -on -one with me so then that becomes a bit more bespoke and if you're in London and you'd like to come and see me in my classroom then I'm more than happy to to work with you in person but um a lot of my international students we end up doing it online and i just post them all the materials they need so that we can get to work can you give our audience a sense of an exercise or two of what how one neuroplasticity i'm familiar with basically you're exercising your brain even though your brain's not a muscle it's important mm -hmm. but yeah what are some of the things that one might be actually doing today that they don't even realize? Is it like playing Wordle each day or doing crossword puzzles? Yeah. I mean, those are great things to do, but we even start with the fundamentals of, you know, when they do their science lessons, they learn a lot about how to grow a plant and what are the ingredients that help the plant thrive. So we start with a basic experiment like that. And then we, we trans, you know, sort of then move that a metaphor of the plant to being a brain and what can you feed the brain? Um, what, you know, what are the nutrients that you need? What, what are the, how do you give it the oxygen? How do you give it, what does it, how do you get that? So then we make it very practical for them. And um, that's the sort of the gen the starting point of understanding that everything happens through here and that you can change the way things are for you so a lot of children come to you with um, set ideas or fixed mindset ideas because they were put in a certain class for maths because they weren't the strongest at their times table that I'm not good at maths and that kind of language and that kind of belief system or I'm not a good uh, athlete because I wasn't picked for the A team for netball or whatever it might be or basketball and they get one thought stuck in their head. And I think that's the thing that I try and break is that that was something in one set of time for that context. How can you reframe that for yourself if you want it? What can we do to change that for you? So there's a lot of um, sort of exercises that take you from when you were little, what couldn't you do? How did a baby learn to do this? And what, you know, practice, practice, practice. So it is things like that. And then, um, you know, idea of uh, journaling affirmations, giving them the prompts to do that. And then genuinely run, like singing to Taylor Swift, shake that off. So shake off negative things and using music, dance, drama, whatever the young girl might be into. So I spend a lot of time trying to get to know the young person before I start the mentorship. And if drama is their thing, then, then we get in there with role play. And if it's not, then we use art or we use drawing or whatever it might be that might get them to build that rapport with me so that they're as honest as they can be and I can be as helpful and responsive as possible. And is your business model such that you could do almost like a pyramid, like it's more expensive if you want the one on one mentoring, yeah. but if you use the online, then it's more at the bottom of the pyramid where anyone can access it. Is that a fair statement? Uh, ish. Yes. I mean, I still it's the time that I invest each week. So if you are online, then I'm I'm the one still delivering or the teachers are you know delivering the lessons. So it is still that. But the idea is eventually to get myself to a place where I can make resources for them and available for people that can just download it. Um, as part of the lesson so that that would be less um, at the moment my online resources are mostly like conversations uh, on my podcast with teachers head teachers psychologists people that work with young people um, aspirational and on people that have come out of difficult things and, and can offer young people some sort of um, inspirational advice um, so I do a lot of that and I write uh, uh, blogs for them and I, I have other resources on the website that can help people cool. and what is the url for the website uh, www.elevate 
ra.com. Really Ladies and gentlemen, again today on The Caring Economy, we have as our guest, Ramita Anand, who is a trailblazer in the field of empowering young women and girls through mentorship. Ramita, I wonder if you might tell us a little bit about um, any sort of global observations. I know you're in the UK, Canadian, born and raised. Uh, we're speaking in English. Is is your work all Anglophone? Is it is there potential for a multilingual solution? Or do you recommend other peers across the globe to people, say, in China or in uh, in Japan or other countries where there might be a need for your services? Yeah, it's interesting you brought up China. I, I lived in Singapore up until last year, so that which is where I launched uh, Elevate. And the, the uptake of this type of service was a little bit more resisted by the, by the locals, I have to be honest with you. That was my take. Um, having said that, um, the, my, the Indian community in Singapore were really up for it. So I think, I think a lot of Asian cultures are coming out of the the need for what they call enrichment classes for for academic subjects. So the Khan Academy was uh, something that most families in Singapore were very well versed in and knew about. Um, but my services were not something they saw a huge amount of value in, which is interesting, given where in the West, all of these areas of, of growth are, are seen as quite valuable. Um, so I, I, what I would say is that I would love to be able to work with teachers that are trained in different languages, because I do think uh, there is a need for it, in, especially in cultures where maybe communication about these types of things and feelings is is less of a uh, an, a more like evident, uh, you know, it's not something that happens very commonly in a lot of Asian cultures. I've having being Indian myself, I know that that's true. And I think a lot of the youngsters or the younger moms who have got little kids now, we're all saying that the only way to combat the, the mental health crisis that's approaching with all teenagers and people are almost putting a blind eye to it is by having what Elevate offers. So I think we're getting there. I think we're just kind of rising that curve a little bit. And I think people will start to want it more. And as, as the demand is there, I would love to work with, with more teachers um, from those parts of the world and, and be able to deliver it in different languages, yeah. And, and what about the parents who are, are under such pressure in all kinds of ways in life? How, what sort of, are, what are your sort of, two or three messages to them about helping them is it you know like it yeah. can be price available or you're not alone or talk to me I can help what, <laughs> what, what do you tell a parent who's perhaps struggling in other aspects of his or her life in addition to raising their child yeah I mean I think first thing to, to say is, is to be kind to yourself and, and realize that you know we are in a in a very new era of parenting. And I know every generation probably feels that about the generation in front of them, but but we've never had some of the pressures that we've got, you know, and, and particularly these teenagers that have just lived through a pandemic, are, are looking at AI, have social media on tap, never been a part of TikTok before, you know, all of these things that are, um, the, the, the information overload for youngsters is, is massive. And I think parents are overwhelmed with what to do and, and and are probably getting mixed messages between schools and friends and ships and career pressure and all sorts of things. So yeah, the, the first thing I always say to parents is, is, is to understand that this is tough and, and, and it's okay to say it's tough because it's true. I think where you get into trouble is parents that want to seemingly act like it's all going perfectly well for their family and their children. And they never want to admit that there might be a slight issue going on at home or, uh, you know, yeah. something is tr tough. Cause I, I, you know, I think we've always almost celebrated that kind of glossy, perfect life for too long. And what we really need to do is, is normalize honesty and, and be vulnerable with each other and say that it takes courage to, to admit we're finding things tough and, and, and really celebrate that when they do and when they come to you um, for help. And, and to, to know that not everything is you're doomed because they're having a tough time right now that this too shall pass you know and we've got we've got a great thing you're aware you know that you're struggling and and that's the massive thing to celebrate yeah you know I think that message that you're not alone I, I sort of use humor at times in coaching people and saying you know like this is not an original script it doesn't yeah. mean to diminish what they're going through but I try to help them realize that if you step back this is a very common thing and take some kind of comfort in that and then more importantly, or as importantly, learn from the universe of those who've gone before you, you know, so you can have their insight, their experience, 
to access and to help you better understand what you're going through, which I know you do for your clients. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's a wonderful message. Now, I know there aren't always Hollywood endings with challenges, but can you give us one or two examples of sort of your favorite success stories and your programming and some of the kids? You can change names or not use names or circumstances to show folks how you deliver or have delivered. Yeah, I think um, the... You know, you really hope that this is this is going to be the thing that changes the trajectory that the child was on, but you don't always know. Obviously, there's lots of factors. So I would never take full credit that it was the Elevate uh, program itself that that offered the the complete transformation of a young person. But but I definitely know that it's given hope and a lot of positivity and changed the relationship at home. And that um, that to me is kind of you know brings so much peace and joy to my heart because. When you, some of these girls first arrived, life at home is so challenging. They do, they're slamming doors. They don't want to see their parents. And um, by the end of it, you know, they've come together in, in a really lovely, positive way. And they found a, a happy medium. I'm not saying they'll say that their parents are wonderful and perfect and smile for photos with them. That still doesn't happen. I know with most teenagers. But um, but at least when they're they're scared or they're upset or something's going wrong, they've got the language and they've got the tools to share that they are. Um, one particular girl who was... Um, really struggling with an eating disorder and, and anxiety through our program through our program together we walked on little little steps some different things of how she could come out of her room and how she could possibly you know she has real anxiety about going out publicly because of her relationship with food and everything result you know when you're out with friends is all around what you're going to get to eat what are you going to you know all that stuff so she wouldn't see people and it was really troubling her parents and that was really quite a hard thing for them to watch and um you know through lots of work that we did together and and then for her to reach out for more professional help it you know she did get an official diagnosis and and that then set her up for a road of recovery but her mum maintains that it the breakthrough came when she was able to find a safe adult to talk to and that she could trust and and that makes me feel you know like wow, we managed something pretty amazing here. Um, yeah. Another another child who was really a, a misfit at school didn't fit in. Never re- teachers never got her, um, and it turns out she was actually extremely gifted, and she was one of these um, you know very talented, gifted children that was because her way of thinking was di- aligned differently, but she just needed someone to really make her feel special for who, for what that was. And, you know, not to make her feel bad about the things that she wasn't into because the other peers in her class were into those things. And all of that really, um, you know, can play into bullying and complain to all sorts of things, but seeing her sort of running and heading school council and doing two grades ahead of her work, you know, it's amazing to see that we've discovered, we've unlocked this bit of her and now she's doing fantastic. I know I do think one day she'll be on the stage winning a Nobel prize or something. <laughs> <laughs> and again, yeah. not an original script. You do hear about this often, right? Particularly mm. children, and it's us. It's more art, I think, but partly science. What you're doing, right? You have to mm. be grounded in the science, which you are, but also it's just that ability to kind of just step back and assess the person, the situation, and all those dynamics is pretty impressive. <laughs> well, it's it's uh, it's it, I do you know I think one of the things we talk about mentorship is is how it goes both ways. I do find that. Through each program, I, I I come back and I think, wow, I learned more than I think I was able to impart on my on my mentee. So I do I do value what they share with me. It's in and one of the ma- biggest things I think for me and I think for parents too is just take the time to listen. They often do have a lot to say. It's just we're not really always ready and tuned in to when they are ready to share their what they want to tell us. Yeah, can you say a little bit about young young men and boys? What uh, it, different physiologically we know but um your expertise has been so far young women and girls is there potential yeah. to use for young men and boys or is that um, yeah I, I love this question because I am I, I since I launched that, that's yeah I do have a son I do um that's been the first uh thing that people have been asking and I think the universe has a funny way of wanting to make it happen if it, if it does what you know if it's out there for me so yes it's something I'm I, I don't want to speak prematurely but it's definitely on the radar it's definitely on my cards of something to pursue I'm desperately trying to work on ways to elevate boys as well as girls I know that boys have their own challenges um 
I just felt most confident in delivering it for Girls First because of my own experiences. And um, the last few schools I worked in were co-ed, but I did do a lot of work in single sex schools as well. Um, so it informed a lot of my practice and I just wouldn't want to get it wrong for boys um, in the, in the like I said, in eight weeks, you don't, or 10 weeks or whatever time you spend with the kids, you don't necessarily, you, you'd have time to build a huge amount of relationships. You've got to get them quite quickly. And I was, if I'm really honest, just wasn't a hundred percent sure that I could do that you know I can talk about um a lot of things that girls are interested in much quicker <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah so so but but that was one but I'm I am talking to people that are interested in, in elevating boys um that want to help me so that's one of the things that I'd like to grow elevate with is is being able to support boys with the right yeah. people I'm just wondering out loud, I mean, you could possibly share your pedagogy with other, or maybe you do, other individuals and organizations around the world who have different audiences. It could be African-American youth, it could be boys, it could be any number of things where you don't have, by birth, you don't have the the physical or the cultural presence that they do, but your pedagogy probably applies, right? It just has yeah. to, to those yeah. audiences. Yeah. So if if you're out there listening and you think you might be interested in working with young boys and and elevating teenagers in uh, with some positive superpowers, get in touch. I, I I'd love to be able to get this out there because I do believe in it and I do think it has a lot of potential to help. And the best many- way to get in touch is how. Uh, email me uh, with uh, through my website. There's a there's definitely a contact me a page there. I have I'm on Instagram at elevate.ra and then LinkedIn which, Ramita Anand uh, as well. Uh, so any of those ways would be great. Cool, you heard it, folks. Let's go for it. Um, last question mm-hmm. I have for you is sort of uh, broader than uh, elevate. It's it's about pearls of wisdom you've gleaned in life for either career success or personal success. Um, do you have a mantra or things you say regularly to people about how to live a happy, fulfilled life or have a rewarding career? Oh, that's if I if we if we had that figured out, would would we all be on the journey that we're on? Um, I, it's been it's been amazing to to think about what those things are for each of us, and I think um, for me, it's it's come much later than I would have liked it to. So I think I was chasing. Uh, things that I thought were going to make me happy um, in my 20s and 30s and believed I, I I knew what it would take to figure it all out. And then life throws you curveballs and you start to realize, oh, gosh, you know, um, but for me, it really is to find it, it's, it's simple. Like happiness to me is, is the simplicity of life. If you can make every day and find simple pleasures in what's in front of you instead of waiting for what's coming next and, and not enjoying the present moment. I think staying present has been a huge challenge for lots of us, including me, but definitely something that I've turned a lot of my attention on and really rejoicing in the wins, whatever they are, small or big, and, and making sure that I keep that virtue uh, lies in the middle, which is what my mom used to say to me, always there. And, and really going for things, even if you're scared. I think a fear holds so much of us back for so much in life. and um, you got to ask for yourself where this fear came from, you know, and, and, and you are, you're the person that can break it and let it go. And what's the worst that can happen, you know? Yeah. So I think um, we, it, just a few, not that long ago in my, in my late thirties, probably when someone said to me, you can only regret the things that you don't do. Yeah. It's been, so that has been my mantra. So I really do make sure I go for everything. I actually went and um, had the, the letter, the word C S I in Italian. Yes. Uh, tattooed on my, on my wrist. Cause I want to be able to say yes to as many things as possible and make sure I don't ever regret things. Yeah. I love that. Certo. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I also love that you, um, you're able to channel your mom. I mean, I lost my dad at a very young age. Um, so yeah, I don't really recall, but to lose a parent or a senior figure in your life like that, it can be devastating. So I'm loving that you were able to still channel goodness from that. Um, yeah. Shout out to her, right? We love yeah, her. To- <laughs> absolutely. No, I do believe in, um, you know, that kind of angel like or universe energy, the universal energy. And I do feel like her energy is with us. And she was a really smiley, smiley, happy, optimistic person, even while she was uh, fighting some some scary stuff. So I remember that uh, as my, uh, definitely as my anchor. She is definitely the, my North Star for sure. Well, yeah. I see that the <laughs> apple does not fall far from the tree. <laughs> so. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. 
<laughs> Ramita Anand, thank you so much. Founder of Elevate, a uh, powerful platform for young women and girls and mentorship is at the core of it. I hope you'll come back to us when you're ready to launch your next chapter, whether it's boys and young men or it's growing into another language platform um, or doing something with Khan Academy. We're going to follow up on that on our end. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yes. Watch this space and let's pr- let's fingers crossed that we cross paths to share more news and, and spread and elevate others along the way. Amen. Thank you, Ramita Anand.